People will write me off or not talk to me or disregard me in conversations. I get that quite a lot and you get used to it. It gets commented on a lot. Hi everyone, welcome to the Next Level Finance Podcast, episode eight. I'm sure we're gonna have some um, uh, trailers on that fun. Um, we've got the legendary Sam Cook here. Thank you so much from Blue Bricks Magazine. That's one, all the way from Bradford, just to see you this morning, so thank you for having me. I, I love it, and I really like when people come, especially entrepreneurs from all over the country, to come and see us, to give us value, which Sam will be doing. And I hope you enjoy this podcast, because this is gonna be an eye-opener, because some of the stuff Sam's gonna answer, I'm not sure he's ready for some of it, <laughs> I'm sure he is actually. Um, it's gonna be a difference maker, so get ready to watch this, and we love to get feedback and the value that you've got from watching this podcast. Community Communicate to us so you can comment on the like and comments below um, and get ready for the roller coaster. Right, Sam, let's get into this fun, right? And you've obviously made a bit of a journey down from Bradford yeah. uh, in Yorkshire, um, which is obviously a bit of a trek. Did you drive down today? Yeah, I drove down today in my blue car on brand. Um, wow, I love it. <laughs> four and a half Blue hours. for Blue Bricks magazine. Yep. Just to remind <laughs> everyone if they've not seen the logo. <laughs> yeah, um, four and a half hours, but yeah, it, it was. Um, I, after I got out of Bradford, quite a peaceful drive, so I can't complain. Wow, wow. And do you know, it's, it's for me, one of the reasons why we set up the Next Level Finance podcast is to give people insight how entrepreneurs think. Yeah. For me, it's so huge. And I, I, I think people don't realise what you can learn from other entrepreneurs, yeah. getting their different perspectives. And this is what it's all about. So we're going to have a bit of fun. And we normally... Uh, always try to start with a bit of the background of the person, just give yeah. a bit of insight because some of the audience will probably know you, but some will not. So yeah. could you give a bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sam Cook. I'm the editor and owner of Blue Bricks Property Magazine. Um, Blue Bricks is a national magazine for property investors and property developers. Um, and we basically exist to tell the truth about property, which we'll dive into a bit on this podcast, um, to help people who are in property, who are looking to build the wealth through property, to do that by getting the right information from the right people, whether that's tax advice on how to tax effectively structure your property portfolio or whether that's advice up from people like John Howard from, from Sky TV who you work with on a particular subject or strategy like auctions and buying at auction. So that's us. And I, I think it's really useful to mm. get insight because you've worked with some industry like John Howard, yeah. I think you mentioned Randall Bacharya and yeah. there's many others, um, uh, probably not at that level but they got a lot of insight and a lot of knowledge and that's what you use the platform of Blue Bricks Magazine to communicate their value to the audience yeah. out there who want to invest in property basically or understand entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. And, and the value and the knowledge and the information that's in Blue Bricks isn't me or my advice or my experience. It's the people that we interview like John Howard. So uh, another person we interviewed who have not read, the, the article's not been published yet, but people like Alfie Best. Wow, um, okay. So some really amazing people and sharing their stories, their insights, their kind of success in business is really inspiring. Yeah, and I, I think it's always looking at whether you know the person or not to see yeah. how their view is on business. Yeah. And for me, I learned so much. I'm so humbled that we're quite fortunate that we get exposed mm -hmm. and understanding of entrepreneurs, whether they're starting up or well-established or running in the multi-millions yeah. and being on Sky TV. It doesn't yeah. really matter because their mindset is what we want to know, how they attract uh, different problems, how they approach it and how their mindset then allows them to overcome the challenges. Yeah. And I think you're going to add huge values. I wanted to talk about, because obviously, you know, if we're allowed to say, you're quite a young entrepreneur. Yes. You know, I, thought, I used to think I was one of those, but the grey is a start. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to understand is, what is your personal challenges that you've had being in a young entrepreneur? Because you were talking to a fear that's been a challenge, right? Yeah, so be, being a young entrepreneur is challenging in the fact that being young comes with the stereotype of being naive or inexperienced or stupid. Um, you go to events and that kind of thing, and I've been to events where I'm trying to grow the beard out in case you can't tell, um, where I know I look quite baby-faced, and people will write me off or not talk to me or disregard me in conversations. I get that quite a lot, and you get used to it. It gets commented on a lot. I think the challenge for me is that I just want to be seen as a successful business owner and I want Blue Bricks to be successful for Blue Bricks. I don't want my age to be a part of it. I don't want to be that 
young entrepreneur that's doing well. I just want to be an entrepreneur. Um, so I think that that's the challenge is just trying to not get people to look at my face or my age, but to get them to look at what, what we're building, which, like I say, isn't just me. It's the people that we interview and the stories that they share. I think you've explained that really well and a lot of wisdom there. I, I think, uh, I know it's a cliche, but age is a number. It yeah. depends on the mindset of the person. Because I've met entrepreneurs all through from, I've even had clients who were teenagers who started yeah. YouTube businesses and things like this. And to people yeah. in 50s, 60s, or even later, still doing entrepreneurship. I think mm -hmm. I've even got a potential client we've dealt with is in, in his 70s. Uh, yeah. um, it depends on the hunger, desire, mm -hmm. right? And how you uh, absorb yeah. information. And I think a lot of people struggle with this because they don't realize that there's more than one way of doing things. Yeah. Right? There isn't one answer, hence why, you know, why so many different entrepreneurs are successful. Yeah. And one of the things I try to understand from entrepreneurs is how they approach it. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I like in their personal challenges sort of explains a lot of stuff. Uh, I think one of the things you've mentioned is that you obviously uh, have the challenges of you're in your 20s, I'm not going to mention yeah. the people, but you're in your 20s, and you're still really new on the entrepreneur journey, Yeah. but you have had exposure because you mentioned to me before that your environment that you were in wasn't an entrepreneur environment, but your dad was an entrepreneur, is that right? Yeah, so for, for me, the background where I'm from, if anyone does or doesn't know Bradford, um, where I'm from, the, ground, the, the town I grew up in, entrepreneurship wasn't a thing, I wasn't taught, it wasn't taught in school, it's not really known. Where I'm from, typically business owners and people that set up in business, set up as trades, joiners, plumbers, that kind wow. of thing. It's just, the, the way I describe it, and it makes some people laugh, is the town I'm from is a kind of place where people are born and die and never leave. What, Bradford? Uh, yeah, Bradford and some of the towns within right. it. There's this thing in West Yorkshire where it's like, if it's not in Yorkshire, it's not worth seeing. So, <laughs> you know, things like travel, business, meeting other cultures, it's just not taught. Um, so that, that was one of the challenges for me in going into business and, and entrepreneurship was, no one from my current circle at that time understood it. I didn't know people like you. I didn't have anyone to support me. There was only my dad. My dad's a business owner. He, he opened a gardening business and he understood, all right, you, you're working late. It's a business. It's going to take that. Yeah, the early days are tough. You're not going to make a lot of money. And he, he just kind of got it. And he was like, look, son, whatever happens, if you're happy, I'm happy. I'm proud of you. Um, the rest of the family and the friendship groups were just, what are you doing? Why, why would you drive to London to meet someone for a podcast or to do an event and why would you work those hours and I still get people now that don't see me in years and I go all you ever seem to do is work and I go it's not work it's a lifestyle it's what I love I'm, I'm never working this isn't work. If I can unpack because you've given huge value oh, in your answer there one of the things which surprised me because I've visited Bradford some people call it some different other <laughs> stuff as well uh, we could go into that I'll probably start a load of politics jokingly I had some friends who used to call it Bradistan but anyway um, when I've gone up there I'm surprised because I found so many entrepreneurs because I've known people in Bradford Keithley yeah. the surrounding places and entrepreneurship is quite high up there I found so I, I guess it depends on the the people that you have in your yeah. network or immediate network, right? Yeah. Because there is a lot of businesses up there. It's quite thriving the, in some aspects, no? Yes, and I, I'm starting to meet them now, so I think I phrased that wrong. But coming from, yeah. from, from school into that, it was new to me. But yeah, the, there is in Keyflow, surprisingly, in the hidden, and now you meet someone, you go, we've got these amazing businesses yeah, in this yeah. town that are like hidden down the back streets. Yeah, you are right. Yeah, right I, I, yeah, I went up there and uh, I had some friends from university from mm -hmm. up there and we used to have a load of jokes and things like this. But when I went up there, I saw, you know, you've got amazing restaurants, yeah. you know, like, as anyone if ever goes up there, that's one thing you've got to check out. And it's a, it's a very different environment uh, up there. Yes, there is, as everywhere, mm -hmm. some tough neighbourhoods, yeah. right? So anywhere where you have a uh, huge amount of different uh, cultures in one place there's ups and downs I think we were talking about that yes. as well but I think that adds to the culture of the place right and I've actually seen a lot of property entrepreneurs now in Bradford because mm -hmm. of social housing requirements yes um, I know when we're talking about these are the things that come to my head when I speak of Bradford um, mm -hmm. I think there is entrepreneurship there but it depends on the mindset and your environment mm -hmm. And I think that's where you've probably mentioned is that apart from your dad, there wasn't many other entrepreneurs no. uh, and your close friends weren't entrepreneurs, I no. guess. Uh, and no. that's where you probably got the challenge why you're not in a job. 
yeah, like the, the yeah, classic, the, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Like, what, why are you working? One, you know, there's been, I, I know someone from Bradford who was a drug dealer. Um, wow. Got okay. quite heavily involved in it and then turned it around up and, and became quite a successful entrepreneur. So there's a lot of that too. Wow. I think there are entrepreneurs sitting in Bradford. I might have upset some people by saying this. You walk around London and you're inspired. Oh, look at these big buildings, these amazing things that people built. This is fantastic. And it inspires you to go, I can do anything. When you're walking around Bradford, you, you don't get that, that same kind of feeling really. And it's like when I go to London, I'll go to cafes, I'll meet people my age uh, in their 20s and the stockbrokers working at like, you know, JP Borg and these amazing companies. Yeah. And then, you know, you come up to, to, to Bradford and it's not that working at JP Morgan's better than any other job, I'm not saying that, but it's just a different mindset and it's just a different way of living. I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. I think a lot of people have different perspectives yeah. on how they see it and there's nothing wrong with that. I think one of the things I've looked and talked about Bradford, uh, you have way more exposure and experience is, I found the property market focusing on that is very different in Bradford yes. because historically it's not had capital appreciation. Is that... Yeah. Fair to say? I think so in some ways. Bradford is extremely strange. I the beat the BD postcode, it covers a lot of areas and there's some areas like Ilkley that are so expensive that, that are What's the name of the area? Ilkley. I think it falls okay. under Leeds Council, but right. oh, is it an LS postcode? I forget. It's either under the, the Bradford yeah. postcode and Leeds Council, it's the other way around. Yeah. Lovely area, prestigious, you know, house prices, hundreds of thousands, then you go to Bradford City Centre you can pick up houses for tens of thousands. Um, so it's a strange area in terms of some areas haven't risen in capital appreciation, but also you can be in the worst part of town, drive five minutes down the road and be in the nicest part of town, and house prices and where you live in are completely different. It's a very interesting place. I, I think you've nailed it, and I don't know how close Harrogate is to that. But About 30 and 5 minutes. Yeah, yeah, so that's in Yorkshire, isn't it, as yeah, well? Yeah. And I've been there because I, I used to work for a company called Vocalink and they had yeah. the, the link part of it mm -hmm. was in Harrogate. Oh my God, it's like a total different world because yeah. you've got so many wealthy people living mm -hmm. there who work, say, in London and yeah. work up there and they live properly with their weekends. So that defies logic because yeah. of appreciation. So you're absolutely right. It depends on the community in that area and what their finances are, which drives the property prices. Right? Yeah, I, absolutely. And, the, you know, Harrogate is another perfect example of somewhere that's close to a part of Bradford, but it's just worlds apart um, in terms of, you know, demographics, house prices, everything. And I, I think it goes back to one of the things, because mm -hmm. also, also we're talking about entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. things, your exposure to people. One of the things that stuck out for me, Sam, uh, and as people know, I don't blow smoke up people. Everyone knows that. <laughs> I tell people how, how I see it, uh, whether they agree or not in trying to be in the best way, is I th for someone young, as a young entrepreneur, one of the things that sticks out is how you are taking information in yeah. and how you're going out a way to build relationships for people from all different backgrounds, which is a big testament to you and your family, how you think, because especially in the modern day, that's quite a bit of challenge for people, especially when you're outside your um, natural habitat or, you know, your comfort zone. Yeah. So how have you developed that? And I think that's quite, quite, quite powerful. Yeah, because I, I am young and I know that I'm young <clears throat> and I know that there's a lot of people out there that know a lot more than me. So to be surrounded by and, and interviewing people like, you know, yourself, John Howard, James Sinclair, all these amazing people in business, I think I'd be an idiot not to take the opportunity to absorb what they know and use that as an opportunity to improve myself. Um, and that, that's it. I'm, I'm inspired by people. I just want to learn from people. I know I'm young. I know that as much as I know, and I probably know a lot more than a lot of people my age, there's still so much more to know. I, I, and you've put it on the hit the nail on the head. I yeah. think one of the things to unpack that, it's how do you create value? Yeah. And you create value by understanding different ways of approaching a problem yeah. and trying to find the solution that's relevant to that situation. Yeah. And that comes from experience and knowledge. And having that open mindset, I think, is a big credit. Uh, I think it's really, yeah. really quite powerful. Um, I think one of the other things that um, is what you seem to like many entrepreneurs, irrespective mm -hmm. of their age, the biggest challenge they have is from the people that are close to them, yeah. right? And a lot of the, the people are saying, why are you an entrepreneur and not doing your nine to five, nine to half five? Because it is a bit of a different mindset. Mm -hmm. How have you overcome that and try to get those people to stop being obstacles, try to you know, help support you. I know you're not going to get everybody, but yeah. key people you've got to get on side, otherwise it's a lonely world as an entrepreneur anyway. 
Yeah, the thing that worked for me was limiting exposure to certain people, right. which is hard at first with family and friends. And now it gets to the point with certain friends and a lot of my family, I just don't talk about business. I don't talk about what I do for work. I don't talk about where I am, what I'm doing. If the conversation comes up, I'll politely answer it. I'm never rude, but I'll quickly move on. If someone asks what I do for a living, I move away from it because I understand that they they just that they don't understand. I understand they don't understand. That's the best way of explaining it. And the at first it hurt a lot because you're like, oh, I've just done this thing in business. I've got this new client. Oh, I've had this struggle. The first thing I want to do is tell my friends. I want to tell my family. Um, and then you do that, and it's like, why you do that? You're an idiot. Or, well, you, you've just got your first client after three months. I've been paid X amount in those three months. And it can kill your soul when you're new to, when you're new to the journey. My friends, my family now with Blue Bricks, because Blue Bricks is a physical product, and with the events we run and how packed they are, people are seeing the success now. And now that people are seeing it, they're going, oh, now I kind of get it a little bit more. Um, but I, I just stay away from people who I think are going to be a danger. Someone taught me something very useful. I'll tell you this for the podcast. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's two types of people, useful people and dangerous people, and that can change in any situation. So if you start... Just, just interject on that. Yeah. What, what I always ask people what the percentage of it are, because I actually... Right, agree. okay. What do you feel from useful and dangerous people? What kind of split do you think of people you meet fall in those two categories, if you can give that? I think it depends because someone can swap between the two. Right. So let's say if you said to me, and you, you don't need to, and I'm not saying it for this reason, but if you said, you know what, Sam, I, I want to lose loads of weight, get to the gym, you know, become a bodybuilder. If I said to you, don't do that, that's, you know, you, you look fine as you are, why would you go to the gym at five o'clock in the morning, get some sleep, get some rest? I'm, I'm a danger to you at that point. Mm. I could have been a really good friend for all these years, but in this, I'm a danger. And yeah. I might only be a danger in that section of your life. So I think useful people, dangerous people, decide whether someone's useful for what you're doing or dangerous. If they're dangerous, limit as much time with them. And the useful people go, that's an amazing idea. I support you. Tell you what, I'll do it with you. I'll drive you to the gym. Spend more time with those people. Do you know what? That's wisdom beyond your years, right? That's being an entrepreneur, actually understanding. Because as I said earlier, that it's a lonely world being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Because it's sometimes just you, yeah. right? Because you have to have a wisdom and sometimes you have to be single-minded, yeah. right? And I know people say, oh, what do you mean? But you do, because if you listen to everybody else, you don't have no business. Yeah. I've seen so many entrepreneurs give up, but that's why the failure rate, which I've mentioned in the first two years, is about 80% of businesses. Yeah, it's, huge. it's huge. And the, one of the reasons is this, mm -hmm. the mindset, because most businesses make losses in the first few years. This is normal. So you need to think about cash flow for those years, how you're going to do that. I know there's exceptions, but generally it's quite hard. Yeah. Because you've got yeah. to put the investment up front, right? Mm -hmm. And you probably lose if you lose some income because you're used to guaranteed, or as, as they say, guaranteed income from a job. Yeah. Right? Because as we know, there's no guaranteed income, especially in the current climate. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And, and I think that's the mindset. And having that, shows that you're going to be innovative, you're going to push and not give mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Because entrepreneurship is not about giving up, it's about finding solutions to problems mm -hmm. and overcoming challenges. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the big challenge people find. I it, don't know what your views on that. I, I think you're 100% right, hit nail on heads. Um, entrepreneurship business is one of those things where the early years, you sacrifice, 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 sacrifice time, sacrifice money. Um, with you obviously want to fail, but knowing that every odd in the world is stacked against you and you say 80% chance that you're going to fail and you take that sacrifice at the beginning. I think, and I'm not one of these entrepreneurs that's like, don't work a job, don't get an nine to five, that's stupid. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. Yes. But in my eyes and my opinion, a job is the other way around where it can be like, I'm, I'm working these years now and I'm getting the instant gratification, but when I'm 60 and I hate my job, that's when I'm going to be struggling. So I think entrepreneurship is just doing it the other way around. Again, I don't think everyone should be an entrepreneur or a business owner. I don't think there's anything at all wrong with not being. Yeah. I have to be like this. I love this. This is me. Yeah. But I also appreciate that in the eyes of some people, I am an idiot driving four hours uh, and working sometimes odd hours and sometimes doing 18 hours in a day, which I don't always advise. So I get both sides of that picture completely. It, it, it is a challenge. There's, there's no dispute in that. I think um, one of the, the things is, obviously you've dealt, talked, we talked about a bit of the personal challenges, right? Yeah. I'm gonna to touch on some of the business challenges. Oh, 
One of the, the things that, especially in what you do or any um, service-based business yeah. or uh, subscription-based mm-hmm. business, which I guess your business will yeah. fall into, is how do you build collaborations? Because one of the things I've seen from when I spoke to you and the people that you've mm-hmm. mentioned uh, are obviously top of the game, yeah. right? How have you gone about building collaboration? Because the entrepreneurs watching um, or the audience watching, that's the biggest thing they have to overcome. Yeah. And that's the most worrying thing a lot of people find. How do I build relationships with someone as collaboration mm-hmm. that is going to win-win for both people? How do you do it? Yeah, so I'll tell for, for anyone new starting out, this might be quite helpful. It made me laugh. I get people messaging me now saying, Sam, I want to collaborate. I want to talk about collaboration doing this. And I go, I recognize that name. And I'll go into my messages. And when I first started out on my journey, before Blue Brits Magazine, before anything, there's these people saying, I don't have time to speak with you, we're too busy listen to my podcast um, and now they come to me and go let's collaborate so that's been quite a fun journey to go the, the full circle how to build collaborations it takes momentum you get one good person or more well-known person and the cr- guilty by association works both ways you can be guilty by being around the bad people you can be guilty by being around the good people and eventually when you're around enough good people you pick up their reputation to begin with, it was just being authentic. I've never pretended to be more than I am or bigger than I am or anything like that. I'm always honest, I'm always truthful and being genuine allowed me to be seen by the right people. And those right people could tell that I was genuine so they wanted to help me. And then that just built up from, from there, really. So my advice would be just be a good person and just be yourself and the rest will fall into place. Do you know what? That already sounds added huge value. If you just take on board what you said, I actually live and die by that pretty much. <laughs> um, uh, because if you're authentic, and that doesn't mean upset everyone, no. that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is be authentic to stand by your values. And generally, most people that do that, you, you know where you stand. And that's why they build real relationships, not uh, artificial ones. And I think that's one of the challenges I find yes. as entrepreneurs, then becoming different. No yep. one knows what this person stands for, that person. And yep. we all know, your personal brand, especially as an owner of any, a small <laughs> SME business, yeah. is key. If yeah. people relate to your brand before they relate to your product, mm-hmm. yeah. you could have the best product on the planet, right? Goods or services, mm-hmm. and people don't like you, they're never going to do business with you. No, no, completely. You could have um, a great personal brand, not the best product or service, but mm-hmm. people will do business because of you. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the, the motion is stronger than the logic. Yes, it is. And I, I think people don't really understand that in business, do they? They don't. And I think we will we'll be talking about the psychology later on. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, I'm looking forward yeah, to that. That, <laughs> that. that could upset some people. Um, but no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I used to hate the term um, pe- people buy from people, but I was actually looking at my advertisers and a lot of the people I work with and a lot of the new members. And I realised that although Blue Brits is a great product and I love the product, a lot of it has just been relationships that I've built with them as a person. And likewise, why I use them as businesses is that you just like them as people. So yeah, I think it's important. What, what I learned when I worked for a, the private equity firm that I bought Blue Bricks magazine off mm-hmm. was that the, the, the real people, the people that are doing stuff, can see straight through bullshit. So yeah. if, you're, if you're online saying, mm-hmm. I've got all these properties and I'm raising this money, I'm doing this and I'm doing that, anyone who's worth the salt is looking at you and going, no, you're not, I know that you're not. You might have loads of sycophants saying, oh, you're amazing. But those people probably aren't investing in your what deals. What was the acronym you just used? Uh, sycophants. Uh, what did you mean by that? Um, basically, sycophants, people that will follow you and, and worship you. And we see a lot of that in within the industry of these influencers. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with being an influencer, but there's a lot of influencers that probably aren't doing as much as so they pretend that they're doing. Um, and that that's great. You know, you, you're really popular, you're really famous, but those people probably won't be investing in your deals. So be honest and be genuine. And the right people and the good people and the people that are genuine themselves will gravitate towards you and will see that. You will repel a lot of the people you probably want to impress without knowing you want to impress them by trying to be someone you're not because they can see through it straight away. I I think it goes back to authenticity, which you mentioned. If people are not authentic, you get found out. Yes. There's nothing wrong being humble. The, yeah. um, you know, yes, you have, there's a confidence and arrogance aspect and yeah. everyone's got a different valuation. But I think everyone being confident and mm-hmm. talking about it's great, but also trying to take people with you, yeah. not say, oh, I'm better than you and all this. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there's the balance. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the hardest thing for one of the people, especially mm-hmm. when they see a bit of success. 
yeah. especially if you've been uh, in the uh, media light or yeah. social media light these days and different things where people take that and it can affect their mindset. Mm -hmm. It goes back to what are you in business for? Ultimately, you're in business to, for me anyway, everyone has a different why, yeah. is are you going to create something that's sustainable for you, mm -hmm. your loved ones? Um, is it going to be something that you're happy to do? Because yeah. when you get up in the morning to drive down and all the rest of it, <laughs> you've got to be inspired. Yeah. You've got to be motivated. If it's going to be something that you're going to say, this is boring so-and-so, I ain't going to bother. Yeah. It ain't going to happen, is it? No. And you're not going to have the passion. When people watch, for example, people watching this, they'll be like, I'm going to switch off if this person doesn't show me the value and yes. the passion. Because people don't want to watch boring people. They don't want to go, yeah, I did A to B. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They don't want to hear that, do they? They want to hear about value, why this person, how am I going to get yeah. inspired? And I guess that leads nicely onto what the Blue Bricks magazine, right? Yeah. And I think what you've tried to mention is how you're going to inspire people mm -hmm. through that magazine. And I guess that's what you've been doing for getting all the different aspects of property investment. Yeah, it has. And it's a fine line between, so f fun fact about me, I hate the whole mindset trend that is taking over the industry. Right. Mindset's super important. If you're going to do an ice cold bath, you don't have to film it and put it on your Facebook story. Genuinely, you just do it. You know what I mean? And I think if you're going to get up at five o'clock in the morning, do your gratitudes, do your yoga, go to the gym, run a marathon, then you get into the office at 10 o'clock in the morning. I started at six and I've done four hours more work. That's probably going to be more helpful for my business. That might have upset a lot of people that are currently writing down the gratitudes and stuff. And look, each to their own, if that helps yeah. you, um, th then that's absolutely fine. So what I'm trying to say is I don't do the fluffy stuff with blue bricks. Right. I understand it's the feel good factor. It's a fine line between inspiring people and saying whatever you want to do in the world is possible because it genuinely is. But here's the actual advice and here's the actual knowledge and here's the actual information that's going to allow you to do that. So yeah, it's inspiring this person's done it and you can do it too, but here's what this person said about how they did it. So that's a fine line that I walk. And yes, I know that might annoy some people, but... I, I think everyone's got their own view. Yeah. Uh, I, I do share some of the stuff uh, around stuff for my personal thing. Uh, I've been slacking on the gym while we're doing this. Need to get back in that. And I do share that and they've done really quite well. But it's more, I think it depends on where you're coming from. Yeah. If people are just doing it to show they're doing it, yes, is different to why if they're doing it to motivate others and inspire others. Yes, exactly, I think yeah. that's the hardest bit because I see some people just do it mm -hmm. just to show. Oh, I've ticked a box. Yeah, uh, I try to explain when I do some of these things, whether I do it or not. Obviously, the audience always can make the decision, yeah, yeah. The ultimate decision maker. But my purpose of doing it is to inspire others to have that balance because. You may have done four hours extra, mm -hmm. right? The productivity is subject to how yeah, you're how you feeling. Feel. Yeah. And you're doing going to gym, things like this actually do help because yeah. stress, uh, especially what we do, is stress is the number one killer, right? Yes. And if you have uh, stress and you don't mm -hmm. know how to remove the stress, you can't be a successful entrepreneur. Yes. And so I, I have to look at people differently to see what they are like and yeah. how they're doing it. And there's such a demographic what helps yeah. uh, ultimately what is the point of them the post or message I yes think that's the key so i try to always relate what i'm doing in because i don't differentiate it between personal and business on most yeah. things right um unless there's some politically touched subjects there right. Right? Yeah. because then i always try to have my views mm -hmm. because people have such differences yeah. generally m the reason why i'm doing stuff personally is to make from the business is the output to, uh, sorry, the personal stuff is the output from the business yeah. because I want my life to be able to spend time with my family yeah. and kids. So I'm trying to get balance right. And as most people know, I'm a bit of a workaholic right. uh, and it's quite hard to switch off because yeah. I'm just one of those people, you know, from the conversations. Stop. Find it, yeah, it's find it hard and you're trying to take a lot of information. So anything that can break that up is a good thing because one of the biggest things I've seen is burnout Yes. Uh, from entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, second thing is motivation's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and the normal thing why these things are happening is because people haven't been able to get the balance. Yes. And if you're trying to educate people why you need the balance, and that's what I try to do uh, in some of the posts, mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense to the social media family, yeah. is try to make sure you have time to switch off. Yes. And as you get older, uh, you know, got a few more years on you, uh, uh, is that becomes more. Because yeah. what you can do, say, in your 20s and 
you know, in your 30s, you can't in your 40s and 50s. It, there's different ways yeah. because you tackle the problem differently. Mm -hmm. What you would know in your 40s, you might not know in your 20s. So you yeah. won't go, all units go from a physical mm -hmm. perspective. You will probably do it slightly differently. Yeah. And that's wisdom. Yeah, I, I agree with you because, and, and again, with the meditation, sort of if that works for you as an individual, mm. absolutely do it. I'm just not a fan of people that do it, not because they enjoy it or because it makes them any more productive, but because yeah. they think it's something you have to do. Um, but if you've just got to find a pattern that works for you. I'm really interested in what you were saying about burning out and stuff, because one thing I absolutely despise is the whole, you own a business, work 15 hours a day, don't see your friends, don't see your family, don't sleep. And from a psychological and a health point of view, that is so bad. I think the stats are you were 75% less productive after 45 hours of work, I think. So it will take you wow. three times longer to do something than wow. it would if you just said, I'm going to take the day off and do that on Monday. I, I, I think it also depends how passionate you are about stuff, yeah. right? Um, and I, I think taking your health, mm -hmm. because ultimately no health, no business, yeah. no anything. Yeah. And I think getting that balance right, mm -hmm. I think people take it to different degrees down to their yeah. levels, but getting that balance I think would be huge. And I think that mm -hmm. leads nicely to the question I was going to ask right, okay. about, is one of the things you've mentioned is the culture in the mm -hmm. property industry, right? Uh -huh. And I know people are going to get ready. Uh, yeah. What I mean by this is there's different perspectives on this, but yeah. from your experience, right, and this is Sam's experience, and everyone will have different views, and this is what we want to know, is how have you found the property industry from a culture and mindset perspective when you've come across people uh, and, you know, uh, the different mindsets as well? Try, try not to get cancelled and try carefully. Um, <laughs> It's really interesting that you ask. I was in a cafe yesterday mm -hmm. and I had an argument with the owner about whether or not property investors are evil. A editor of a property magazine. Hold on, let me stop here. Yeah. The, the yeah. owner of the business yeah. said he reckoned property investors were evil. evil. Yeah, uh, as the owner of a property investment magazine, I spoke on behalf of landlords, you'll be pleased to know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was an interesting conversation. So you've got the, that whole culture around our property people bad and landlords are seen as the kind of sources of all evil in the world. Wow. Uh, and then you've got the culture within the industry, which we'll talk about yeah. the, the psychology yeah. soon. Um, I think the property industry, like any industry, is full of various different types of people, some extremely lovely, um, some that are more out for themselves. I think that this whole... To me, that there's, the, there's two property industries. There's the property industry, the investors and the landlords and the people that are doing stuff. And there's this new industry that, that's farming, which is your influencers and the get rich quick and the overnight millionaire stuff. And that is extremely dangerous on so many levels that, that people don't realise. Not just at the fact that people are losing money, which is really bad, but how that's making landlords look and how that's forcing people to do other strategies and how a max exodus of people doing these strategies like surface accommodation is leading to new legislation entering the industry um, which is actually damaging the private rented sector so i think that side of the stuff is really really bad and really damaging and needs to be looked at carefully i don't think there's anything wrong with property trainers or property educators i'd never say that but I think there is something wrong in the way that certain businesses present themselves and the way that they use psychology and manipulation to sell to people on a subconscious level. I, I think you've hit the <clears throat> now head. One of the areas which is quite tax advantageous, yeah. I talk about, is service accommodation and furniture yeah. holiday let. And, but there's a lot of work because it's yeah. a very intense business. And a lot of people don't get explained. Yeah. Right? They just say, oh, you know what? Uh, we heard from Joe Blogs down the road, there's a lot of tax advantages. Right, okay. Yeah. Right? But then I'm like, but what you're doing isn't actually under tax aspect, yeah. service accommodation. Mm -hmm. You've got specific rules. Yeah. Right? And you've got to make sure you meet those to get mm -hmm. the tax advantages. Therefore, you have to do things differently. Yeah. And I see this a lot from rent to SA businesses yes. and things like this, where people, um, or rent to rent, mm -hmm. and they use it service accommodation, there's so many different names now. There's a lot of challenges yeah. because people don't really understand the strategy. They've not really realized why systemization is so important and the time yeah. investment is quite a big thing they just jump into it mm -hmm. uh, or they 
the flip side, the worst side, they never jump into it, but they want to do it. And it's trying to get that balance. Yeah. I actually think property training is good, depending on yes. who's teaching you, because Absolutely. knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, embrace that. I tell people, I invest constantly on in my knowledge. But I think you've got to know what type of knowledge and mm -hmm. what you need. I find constantly people don't understand the financial side. Mm -hmm. um, and while they're not understand the financial side, they're not going to get the results yeah. that they could. Uh, I think you mentioned that you've been involved. You've got, you're involved heavily yourself in property and you've done uh, some rent to service accommodation. Yeah, Is that right? yeah, I have, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm doing some rent to SA at, at the moment. Um, it's what, in, up in Yorkshire? In Leeds, yeah. Oh, up, in, okay, up in Leeds at the oh. moment. Um, I, and just to go back on what I said about property educators, I believe that the only way that the property industry is going to improve and get better and how we're going to solve the housing crisis is actually through educating more people about property, yes. especially younger people. So I think property ed education is super interesting. I just need to differentiate that from the hard sales that people think property educating is versus getting really good advice and knowledge from, from the right people. But yeah, I, I do some rent to essay up in Leeds at, at the moment. Uh, no money down deal, first of all, no money change hands, but it did wow. cost us about two and a half grand in paint, tools and everything else. Yeah. That's another thing that I fight against is no money down because two and a half grand still is money plus the, the time. Are you talking about the source though? Um, no, um, oh. we, 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 we obviously funded, so we, no money change hands with the landlord. Right. The no money down part. Um, but we had to buy the paint and we had to do the property up. So obviously we pent, we've spent about two and a half grand in paint and tools and everything else, it's quite a big house. Um, and then all the obviously time doing it up because we said it's our, you know, it's our first rent to SA in, in, yeah. in this business. I'm doing it with my partner. Let's do it up together. It'll be fun. It'll be like a hobby. Worst mistake I ever made. <laughs> it's so time intensive. I never want to paint another wall ever again. Um, yeah. I'm sick of sanding walls, painting um, skirting boards. I've learned a lot. It's been good fun, but it's it's a hard job. So yeah, it, it, it wow. can be hard work, the whole refurb side. I, I, I guess you've obviously refurbed. Let's yeah. talk about this property strategy, rent to service accommodation, yeah. quite big right now. So you've got this of a landlord, mm -hmm. you've got a lease put in. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, is it a lease? Kind of. It's yeah. like a sub lease. Yeah, so you're yeah. basically, you've got it for a period of time. Yes. Right, and you're going to rent it out by mm -hmm. the night. Yeah, that's yeah? right. Um, and that's normally how people do it. There is different mm -hmm. ways of doing it, by the way. So yeah. You've got to be careful. Get good tax advice. Yeah. <laughs> right, because this is quite important. Um, but so you've got that. Mm -hmm. Is it making the money that you thought it would make? So it's actually going live at the end of this week. Um, wow. We, I, from some of the estimations and the trials and the tests that I've done, it will make a substantial amount of money. That's a deal. Right. More than we anticipated when we we're first looking at it and um, so i'm very excited to get that live um really really excited it's gonna be good fun and um, i think one of the things that uh you have to be uh careful of mm -hmm. of rent to service accommodation and things like this rent to rent service accommodation is vat yes um because a lot of people i know can't help it the old tax side because people don't think about this yeah um th uh, that is uh, a very big implication short-term lets yes. um, provided meet the criteria so you just got to factor that in mm -hmm. and how it's done do have you i guess on this have you done it for a company or uh, individual i guess you don't through a limited companies yeah through for, for a limited company or my, but, um it's basically the, the, the way the business came around it's called yeah. y homes from home and it's completely different business blue bricks wow. um a friend of mine said i've got this really good idea sam i want to get a property i want to rent it off the landlord I want to put it on Airbnb. I said, you're not going to believe it. There's a whole strategy around that, taking the industry by storm. It's called, you know, rent to SA. So I sat and told yeah. him a bit about it. And he said, you know, I really, you know, I really want to do it and I want to do it with you. I entered the business more for him as a friend to help him. I thought, you know what? I've wanted to do it for a while. I've just not had the time because Blue yeah, Bricks yeah. Is, is my sole focus. And we entered it together. And I've used it as an opportunity to, to do the refurb myself because I want to learn all the different sides of property because it's going to make me ultimately a, a better editor and a, yeah, a better yeah, investor. Yeah. Um, so that, that's how it all kind of came around. Wow, wow. There's a lot of um, advantages around how you refurb and all this to mm -hmm. your circumstances. But yeah, no, that's quite interesting. So you've sort of diversified. You've got your what I call a trading business. Yeah. People will know trading business like Blue Bricks Magazine, and now you've got a property business yes. as well. Um, and then probably, you'll probably be buying some properties and all this stuff going forward potentially. Yes. Um, but I guess it's going through those 
levels and Leeds um, if I get right is quite a big uh, rent to SA area yeah um, uh, I, I know I see one property trainer I'm not going to mention his name <laughs> up there who um, seems to have a big following and right. he promotes quite a lot up there um, and he, that's one of the strategies I guess he talks about uh, yeah and I'm always kind of person wherever you hear other people giving good information good mm. value uh, I think it's always pay respect and listen to them because that's how you get more uh, entrepreneurial and you grow your mindset as well yeah I, I guess it leads us nicely onto um, what your approach is um, one of the things that I've seen entrepreneurs is their approach it defines <laughs> how successful their business is going to be yeah right so if I look at yours all right one of the things that I see in order uh, for your business to be mm-hmm. a success, which um, I think one of the things you said, you've transformed the business, haven't you? You've yes. taken it from um, not being profitable to profit, making a loss, yeah. to profit in, a, in a year. Yeah. What was the key th- drivers to do that? Was it, was it the networking aspect? Was that quite big in this evolution of the business? It was, so, so yeah, so just in case anyone's not familiar with the story, I feel like I've I've told it a million times on podcasts. I, you know, you just yeah uh, assume. yeah yeah yeah. Um, I bought Blue Bricks magazine. I used to work for Blue Bricks magazine. That, that's how I started out. I was an employee of the business. Then after some time, bought the business. Um, it wasn't profitable upon purchase, and I had to step in and do a lot of the work myself. So proofreading, editing, writing a lot of the articles, editing you know a lot of the articles. Um, to the point when I first bought Blue Bricks magazine, and again. I don't advise this for anyone because I burnt out massively and I had personal wow. problems at the same time. I was getting into the office at seven. I wasn't leaving till nine, ten at night, every night consistently. I'm working weekends and it mentally yeah. really, really took it out of me. Um, so I bought Blue Bricks and in the space here, we made it Just profitable. Just on that point, Polish, mm-hmm. how did you overcome that? That's such an important, the burnout. Did you get someone, employ people to do certain stuff, outsource? How did you over? overcome that because that's not sustainable it it wasn't um i lost some people close to me at the same time and i was i was using work as my way of not grieving so i was like on the one hand i've got to get the next issue out and i'd never printed an issue with a magazine before um and the person that was meant to hand it over and teach me how to do it left at the same time so all all the 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 perfect shit's done um (laughs) and it, it was a mixture of I have to get this next issue out um, because I've just taken on the business and it can't be late. And I don't want to stop working because if I do, the grief and the pain and it's all going to catch up at once. I know if I stop, it's really going to hit me. So let me get the issue out of the way and yeah. then I'll face it, I think, was, was the mindset. The way we overcame it was I outsourced, um, found a proofreader. It sounds like a small job. But Huge. just me being able to edit the article or write them and then just pass it to someone and go, make sure that's perfect. I'm not sat here at nine o'clock at night when I'm tired going, put a comma there, put a full stop there, right? Wow. That was a, a huge weight off my shoulders and it sped up the process. I had some some friends as well who just came in and just grammar checked stuff for us, which was a, a big help. So yeah, outsourcing helped massively in the beginning to just take away the pain because you've got to remember while I was working all these hours in a day, None of that was marketing the business or making money or bringing in new clients or making sales. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was all just survival. And outsourcing, even slightly outsourcing at 200 pounds, allowed us to go from a state of survival to right, how can we start to thrive and bring money in and you know grow? On that point, how regularly do you, does the issue of the magazine come out? Is that Bi- bi-monthly. Bi-monthly. Okay, so every couple of months you're... Yeah, so the, yeah, six comes per year, basically. Yeah, six per year, and at that time we were just approaching the end of the run, so we had like two or three weeks to put almost an entire magazine together. Wow! First time doing it with no experience and not no capital, um, so <laughs> it, it was a really fun journey. Um, but yeah, you know, we wow. got there in the end, and we're in the space here. We went from that to a profitable business um, that, that's growing. On the profitable, I want to delve mm-hmm. into this because I love this transformation that you've done. Um, what's the big revenue driver in your business? Is it advertising um, or the subscription or both? It, yeah, it's interesting. So we make income from advertisers and subscribers and we have a, a strict rule because of that that the magazine can never be more than 30% advertising. Right. If we get to 30% advertising in the magazine, we increase the pages in the magazine and then the, the percentage starts again. So it's 70% content. No one's paid for this content to be in the magazine. It's just good content for the subscribers. 
but the majority of our revenue comes from the advertisers wow. who advertise to our su subscribers because the subscriptions print costs rise massively which you know we'll probably touch on later and print in a magazine it, it's expensive it's really expensive to do you've got the design the proofing the print the postage so the the subscriptions really pay for the magazine to be produced Going and then the advertisers kind of bring in the you know the, yeah. the money on top of that so i guess for me um it's just understanding is it is it sent out in uh, hardback form or is it basically online or both it's both it was just hardback when i bought the magazine but now we've got digital and hardback so people can subscribe to one or two so it said do they pay more for the hardback mm -hmm. is that how it works yeah so it's 4.99 a month for the digital yeah and it's 12.95 every other month for the print Go so on. very slightly more so, and then you've built subscribers. Are you allowed to say how many subscribers you've got in your magazine or ballpark? Um, yes, ballpark, we've got 14,000 readers. Wow. Now that, that came from the collaboration element of working wow. with various other people and, and growing the readership quicker. So that's not 14,000 paying people, but it's 14,000 people um, that we estimate are picking up the magazine, reading it, seeing wow. the content inside. So that's the reach. Right. That's reach, yeah. And I guess I know we've not talked about this, but how do you incorporate that with your social media strategy? Because I know we spoke a bit about this, um, and I think this is well, it's not even the future now; it's the present, right? So yeah. How did you, how do you incorporate social media to promote the magazine or get awareness mm -hmm. and reach? So to begin with, um, with it being unprofitable, we had social media that was good, and the person that did it was brilliant. But we could only afford to pay for a limited, um, for, for a limited service. So we were getting the content created and the content was being posted for us, and that that was it. Um, and then with my own personal social media, I actually found the really started using it this year um, because I was terrified actually, deep, deeply insecure when I bought the magazine because wow. of how young I looked. And I was like, I don't want to be. I, and I still don't, and I, I say this to a lot of people, I don't want to be Blue Brits Magazine. I'm not Blue Brits Magazine. I don't want people to look at me and go, that's Blue Brits Magazine, because it's not. Yeah. Blue Brits Magazine is a business that I own, and Blue Brits is its own product. I so happen to be the owner and the editor. And that was my fear when I bought it, was I don't want to grow my personal brand, because what if people judge me? Um, which, ever since overcoming in my head, has skyrocketed the reach and the events we get invited to. I was at the House of Lords uh, yeah. a couple of weeks back with yourself. And that, you know, that's just on that point. Anyone who doesn't, we got that on YouTube. We put a LinkedIn it as was well. Good. So yeah. Yeah. And even TikTok, I was showing yeah. uh, Sam because fast comms. Hi, everyone. Sorry to interrupt the podcast. Hope you're getting a huge amount of value from this. Just going to be quick two seconds. First of all, to let you know in the comments below, we have got uh, links to free business guides that can help you on your entrepreneur journey. They include exclusive footage from Sky TV episodes that I've done and a whole load of other content in there. Whether you're a growing business, property investor, property developer, or if you want to love the fun of SaaS pensions, please do look at those. And if you still want more help, get in touch. The contact details are below. So yeah. I, I guess because you've done so much story to up, is mm -hmm. no, no. which media pla social media platforms are you finding are working for you? I ask this from people yeah. because everyone has a different take and different ones that work for yeah. their type of business. Mm -hmm. For your business, for the Blue Bricks magazine, um, what ones have you found have been really great social media tools? Successful. Um, for the magazine itself, Instagram. Um, for wow. my personal brand, LinkedIn. Uh, wow. My LinkedIn is, it's gone from, you know, a couple of likes to 50, 60, sometimes 100, more than 100. Wow. Which, I'm, I'm not an influencer, but from... How from, many followers have you got, if no one asking? I've got, I think, 2,500 connections or something. Wow. I, I try and do a lot of B2B through LinkedIn. So for me, that, that's been a huge platform for my personal brand and where people see me. Personal brand on Facebook and stuff, I find the Facebook algorithm really hit and miss. I can post something and get over 100 likes. I can post something and get, like, 10 Whereas LinkedIn seems to be more consistent, I know if I post a certain picture with a certain copy, I'll get at least X amount of likes. I, I think Facebook and Instagram is tipping on your followers now. Yes. And they've, they've throttled the reach because mm -hmm. they want paid advertising, including yeah. threads. And that's what I think causes the problem. If you've got yeah. reels, they were doing well for a bit. That reels are videos, by the mm -hmm. way. Um, you do short clip videos because yeah. Facebook has a one minute a fun of social media. <laughs> but the problem with that is, it is hit and miss, mm -hmm. um, and it depends on 
how many followers you've got and it's got harder yeah. on those platforms to get followers so mm-hmm. the people already got the following they're all right yeah the ones that haven't trying to get more is much harder really and i hard, think yeah. that's come across all social media now mm-hmm. because so many people get in the in the space uh, yeah just give you inside my one we use all the platforms yeah when i say all of them linkedin both personal and business mm-hmm. uh we use x uh, yeah. t- and it's actually improved recently, funny enough, even though some of the funny Elon Musk did in the last few weeks. Um, <laughs> we also use YouTube Shorts right. and Long. Right. Okay. Um, we use uh, Instagram, Facebook, Threads. Right. And let's not forget TikTok. And I've got to say, uh, people don't realise, but TikTok has been an eye-opener. Yeah. Um, because, yes, there is some challenges on throttled reach on that mm-hmm. and I was reading a lot about that but when it does go viral on, thro- um, on TikTok it goes viral yeah and is. awareness is huge have you have you found that have you done any TikToks I've not done TikTok myself it's something that we need to start looking at doing so I understand the power I know someone who built up a YouTube channel over the space of yeah, for a couple of years and it got yeah. quite good within a week on TikTok they'd already excelled wow. the, the YouTubes which is huge and um, like, like I say, for me, LinkedIn's been the main one, and my post, it's lovely to see a post and go, oh, look, that's reached 1,000, 2,000 people. Um, th- that's for me for LinkedIn. I don't know if that'd work for everyone. But no experience with TikTok, but from what I've seen of other people doing it, it's working really well, because it's much less saturated in the property space, because it's one of those things that the older generation typically don't get and don't yeah. understand, so they just ignore it, and because of that, it's easier on there to, to go viral. I, I, I've seen so much variety of people, mm-hmm. especially now, it's so diverse. It's actually got harder on all of them because yeah. with the first mover's advantage, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, I think I've coined that from Ranjan actually, he always goes about his first mover's advantage on public right, development. Okay. <laughs> but it is true, whatever you do and you get, you build the following up because once you've got the following, it's quite powerful. LinkedIn is another one yeah. in the last two months, I don't know if you noticed, but the reach has dropped. Yeah, yeah, and that's for everybody. Mm-hmm. It's dropped by from if you did say you were getting ten thousand, you now you'll probably get four thousand or yeah, three thousand. Yeah. That's a huge they're saying it's more targeted, only time will tell. Yeah. But everywhere because they're pushing paid advertising. So if you can get organic reach, yeah, gotta do it. Build your platform. Because I think when we've added up our social media views, we've had probably between two to three million views in the last year oh, across all social slot. media. Um, yeah, LinkedIn being one of the big drives, YouTube being quite big, mm-hmm. and all the rest of them. But it's a consistency. Yeah, And definitely. it's trying to get content value, a bit like what we're doing here, mm-hmm. um, and trying to get it out to people. Yeah. So I, I think social media is going to be huge, and I think it's going to even be bigger for you going forward because you're yeah. communicating value, right? It, it, it will be, absolutely. And our, our reach as the magazine it is different because we... So when someone features in the magazine, they'll share their feature. We get, and it's lovely, we get people reading the magazine, uploading pictures. I had one person on an aeroplane that uploaded a picture and tagged me and it said, I'm going to the Isle of Man on my Blue Brits magazine, and it's lovely. So I think right. our reach is probably bigger than I realised trying to, if I had to track everyone's social media. But that, that's an advantage that Blue Brits has as an independent business. So we automatically get free marketing from, wow. from other people. I, I think one of the other things this needs nicely onto is community. Yeah. Uh, you talked about one of the reasons we were talking about networking, that's how we go into social yeah. media uh, part of the business. I think the other bit is community. You've built up a, quite a bit of the community, yes. which you need to do, especially what you do, mm-hmm. to be able to get your message out yeah. and obviously uh, have that recurring um, interest from people. Because if you've got a community, then people have emotional affiliations to yeah. you. You need that to be successful, right? Yeah. How have you built your community? Um, you will always hear me repeat this, and it's not because I forget what I'm saying, it's because it, it is important. Honesty, integrity, value, ethics, um, being authentically me and being authentically true, and having speakers that share those values. Um, you know, sometimes I've had speakers on that haven't worked as well, and I've learned from that. Um, but being an authentic person, being truthful, like attracts like, we attracted those types of people, getting speakers on that share those values, echoes wow. that message. And eventually it's not, if you've ever been to the, the Blue Bricks event and it's not, it's an event in Leeds, but it's online now. So what we've done is we've integrated Zoom so that you could join from your office, mm-hmm. see the speakers, hear the wow. speakers and, and network on Zoom so it is a community. Um, and it's not like any other networking event you've ever been to. I know a lot of people, businesses say we're different. We genuinely are and that's not me saying it, it's what I've had off of people wow. because it's the loveliest room you'll ever enter. 
Our members bring snacks, bring Doritos, or put out little food tables. I don't ask them to do that. Um, everyone looks after each other, people do business together, they make every single person feel welcome. And that's because we've attracted a small group of good people that's grown. So if anyone's trying to grow a community, yeah. I'd say just stick to your values, be you. If you're not, prof um, the property thing in Darlington do this so well, run by Paul Million and Anthony Boyce, because they're just them, they're wow. 100% themselves. They've built a huge community up in Darlington. My advice for anyone who's looking to build a community, a networking group, anything like that, don't go, right, I need to be formal, I need to be professional, I need to be like these other big event names. Just be yourself and you will attract more people like you, I think. Uh, just touching on those, is it a hybrid in person and online? Yes. Number yeah. one. Uh, number two, how regularly is it? Um, so it's monthly. Monthly. So the, the, the online element is a new thing. The original plan was to open a, a networking event in every major city in the UK. Um, that's super challenging because yeah. you, I'll, I'll be hand on heart and it's anyone that runs an event will agree, you don't make money from events, you just don't, we don't it's make money from it's events. It's brand awareness, isn't it? it? It's brand awareness and it's giving back to our members. So the new plan was right, let's use technology. So, it, so it's hybrid, people can join online now as well. Wow. And it's a community now that any member of Blue Bricks Magazine can join whether they're in Glasgow or, or Cornwall. Well, I'm, <clears> I'm sure when we post the all list out on <laughs> social media, that's the blooper. <laughs> blooper. Um, when we post it all out, basically yeah. you can you can share yeah, that because yeah, I'm I'll sure put... some of the community will, will definitely want to be yeah, like watching that. that. Um, I'm going to read, go on to quickly because I know time is always against okay. us. Um, you you got an award ceremonies, property awards, the first one for Blue Bricks next year. Yes, uh, is this exclusive? It, You're this now is, seeing this, it. Is exclusive. this is exclusive um, on the show. This hasn't been marketed yet, and yeah. uh, I was debating do we do it or not. But I said, you know what? I, I think yeah. this is a great place to start. So Blue Bricks next year, nineteenth of June. Um, as things currently stand, all being well, we are running the Blue Bricks Award Ceremony in Chester. Wow. We've hired out an entire castle. Wow. We're going luxury. We're going high end. I, I can just see the content right now it, in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, that's going to be amazing. It, I don't do things by half, and everything I do, I aim to be different. It's going to be like nothing the industry has seen before for about 200 people at least. Um, and it's going to be a very fun, very value-driven day it's not going to be your typical awards business awards that i've been to where it's loads of people that get together and it's all look at me look at how good i am which is what yeah. a lot of ceremony is based on it's going to be about the people attending and how do we make this such an amazing experience that wow. people just don't forget wow what day of the week is that 19th? i think off the top of my head it is wednesday wednesday okay interesting i'm gonna have to talk about Could that and um, i want to touch the psychology of property entrepreneurs okay and sam blew my mind a bit early he was like look property <laughs> entrepreneurs for list um this is sam's given his view of he's done a bit of psychology and understanding give us what your view of the types of property entrepreneurs and the the mindset, psychology that they have, if I'm allowed to use that word, the, the, related. This will be the bit that goes on TikTok and then wow. goes about. So yeah, this this is a good bit. This isn't me, by the way, this isn't mine. I do a lot of work with someone who's very versed in psychology, who helps me in, in business and personally, my mindset. Um, one, of, one of the best in the UK. And I was, I've been in situations with people where, because my value, one of my main values is, um, I'm trying to think of the word now, but basically, I want virtue, that's one of my main values. Mm -hmm. I'm a virtuous person, I care about people deeply and I'm honest and I'm truthful and I am me, there's nothing hidden. I struggled in life because people will do things against me or sting me or lie or manipulate and I just couldn't ever picture doing that. So I was like, how can this person do this because I couldn't do it? You can't look at the world that way. Some people of will course. you know, do, do bad things to you. And it's a mixture of naivety. But what, the way that I had it explained to me when, when I was working with this person is there's something in psychology called the dark triad. You can Google this. I think that's the term. What's it called? The dark triad, I think Drug is the triad. term, wow. which is narcissists. I think, is it? Yeah. Narcissists, um, psych psychopaths. I think it's psychopaths. Wow. Um, and Machiavellians. Right. Uh, basically, I think I've got that right. I could be wrong. Google it. Um, if I am wrong, you can't say that is wrong because I've, I've admitted it. Um, but basically, the idea is that, that psychopaths and sociopaths are attracted to power and money and wealth. It, the natural there, it's why you get a lot in government. Um, you know, wow. uh, we won't go too political, <laughs> but it's why you see a lot of psychopaths in government and you know everyone knows that a lot of high-achieving people are psychopaths. Yeah. Well, 
what does the property industry give you? It gives you wealth, it gives you power, it gives you yeah. power over people, it gives you power over tenants. What that means is that naturally, psychologically, you, this industry, the property industry, attracts psychopaths. Wow. And it attracts sociopaths, it's just a fact. That means that you have to be very, very careful in this industry because there are a lot of people in it. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying property people are bad, but I'm saying that naturally it attracts a certain type of person where they might not be afraid of doing you dirty on a deal. And that's why you see a lot of people saying, my joint venture went south, my, you know, this person did this, this person ran away with my money. That's one of the reasons why. Property industry isn't a bad industry. It's now filling with a lot of amazing, amazing people that want a change industry for a better, that want to provide housing for people, that want to help charities. But for all the good people out there, just be careful. It's something I'm learning myself. Um, so that's the key bit around valuating people. Yeah, that that's that's the key bit. It's you know, someone the, the same person said to me, it's not about how you are, um, it's about who you are. Someone might be really nice when you meet them, but consistency tells you who someone is. If someone's consistently nice and consistently kind and consistently honest, that's probably who they are. Wow. But you've got to look at people and go, are they a consistent person? And does everyone back that up? Does everyone that's dealt with this person say that, you know, they are this way? Um, just be careful. I, I think you've put nutshell. Moving on, mm -hmm. right, um, because obviously we've talked about a lot of the audience, the different impacts of business, mm -hmm. right? I think one of the things that you'll be obviously quite aware of is technology impacts, because yeah. they're huge in your business. Can you sort of just give us a bit insight um, on how they affected your business technology? Yeah, te technology affects things because it affects a couple of different things. Number one is being a, a print-based business. It's using technology. Some people want to be digital now. Some people want to read a magazine on their phone. And it's, you know, how do we make Blue Bricks accessible to everyone? And that was one of the hardest hurdles is going digital and how do we go digital while keeping the quality? Yeah, um, yeah. Me personally, I love the printed magazine. I love it. I yeah. think when you pick it up and you feel it, um, it's got a much different feel to it. Some people prefer digital. And an another thing was how do we implement technology into the content of the magazine so that investors know how to use tech because we're in a really old fashioned industry. Um, you, you know, and I think with an industry that's very, very slow to change. So using things like data, um, which is something that's coming up in January, we've partnered with a data company, another exclusive for you, wow. that's going to be providing real-time data into changes in a property market that's like basically 90% accurate. Um, and how do we interview people that are really good at AI, that are really good at marketing, wow. and get their advice on what investors can do around social media and around new AI technology that's going to help them as property investors? I, I think one of the things to test the feedback, I guess, mm -hmm. is how the users, are your subscribers, mm -hmm. uh, your advertisers, both clients, uh, yeah. the people who work for you, as well as uh, the ultimate mm -hmm. uh, service provider, you're going to use your magazine as a way to communicate. Yeah. How have they found the technology change? Do they like what you're doing? Have you had good feedback? Because I mm -hmm. guess you've got to keep on testing it, don't you, to see how they are reacting to the differences. To the differences, yeah. We, we've seen a massive uptake in the digital subscription. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Which annoys me. It doesn't know What's me. the percentage if between, um, <clears throat> sorry, a numbers person, oh, no. between digital as uh, to physical hardbacks? It's interesting, yeah. I don't have a percentage. I was looking at this all day. I thought it was 50-50. Yeah. In terms of new subscriptions, it seems to be, but there seems to be a preference on digital, which right. I was going to say, and I was like, I love the print. I don't right. get any more money from people ordering print. It's actually more profitable if they go digital. Yeah, yeah, but I'm like, I just love seeing the, the physical one. Um, but we, I'd say that we're about one third digital. Wow. It wouldn't surprise me if... The, if it keeps going how it is that we end up 50 50. Wow. I'm currently looking at ways and it's small things on how I can make the digital better. So when we started out, the digital was a PDF file. We're now implementing technology to make it a flip through file, a bit like when you've got a Kindle so that you can still, you know, have it on your phone almost like a physical More magazine. Yes, I'm, I'm currently working on stuff like that now, which just makes it a better experience for the reader. Well, because well, obviously time's the essence. What I wanted mm -hmm. to also talk about is. The big thing, one right. of the big things. What do you feel has happened to property investors? The general mindset or general view, I should say, uh, from people is that it's reduced the amount of property investors. What's your experience? First of all, why do you 
Do you firstly agree that it has reduced uh, the amount of property investors in the market to what it was previously? Do you feel that, that you've seen that? I think it's changed. If you look at the, you know, 2008, before 2008, a lot of landlords and property investors were just your average Joe who yeah. bought a house and yeah. rented it out. And when I was an estate agent previously, a lot of the landlords that came in were just kind of geezers that had been builders that had been buying houses that went along. Yeah, yeah. I think that's changing and those people have gone, this is nowhere near as easy or as profitable as it was, you know, when I, when I first started investing. Yeah. Interest rates have gone up. Tenants have got rights now. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, t- tongue in cheek. Um, but I'm going to sell up and I'm going to exit. So I think we've seen that. We've definitely seen an uptake in people entering the industry from a younger demographic uh, and people who are using property as get rich quick or as wealth building, which it, it never used to be really, but it was buy to let, which is get rich slow almost, yeah. um, and, a, and a bit of HMO. I think that the mindset around property has started changing, and we're seeing a lot of people follow the, the get rich quick stuff. Whether you believe in that, whether you don't believe in that, is your own I, I, I think you've sort of, uh, sort of explained what's mm-hmm. happened is, um, I think a lot of legislation, yeah. we've had something called, um, if I'm allowed to say, Section 24, tax and yeah. interest, that's hammered the market. Yeah. Then you've also got all the legislation now, especially if you're HMOs, all the different variations, because it's making it harder. Yeah. It's a lot harder in Scotland and Wales in certain aspects yes. than England, but I'm sure we're going to c- come that way as well. The restriction on rent, so there's mm-hmm. been a lot of legislation. Yeah. I think that's what's led to a lot of landlords leaving. It, um, it and all, also, I think the incentivization for banks, for example, to buy property, which <laughs> is quite ironic um, what they've been incentivized, and yeah. whereas the landlord is being disincentivized, which I don't think is right, and I think this is one of the, the challenges around legislation of landlords, and you'll probably notice it, right? A lot it, of people are leaving because it, they're not making the margins. They're not. The, the problem that we've got at the moment, and it goes back to the argument I had with um, with some oh, pardon, had an argument yesterday in a coffee shop with someone around whether or not property yeah. investors are evil. There's all that stuff around the finances and property investing being harder there's also a social element that people believe landlords are bad people and Mm -hmm. that they're rich and that they have more than them what a lot of people that feel that way fail to realize is that the government aren't building enough houses and they're not building enough social housing of course the only thing that's kind of propping the industry up at the moment are private landlords and if you destroy the private rented sector if you make this sector so hard that no one wants when it and everyone sells up the whole industry falls down because people can't afford houses. So what are we going to do with the mass amounts of houses entering the market? Well, we'll either have a property crash or people just can't afford to buy them. And then no one's got anywhere to live because you can't afford to buy. So what can you do? Rent. Well, if renting is not an option, and we're already seeing that, property investors have been punished so much um, that a lot of them have exited, which has meant there's less, you know, there's less supply. And what happens when you've got more demand than supply? Well, prices go up. So now tenants are paying ridiculous amounts for property for houses so who's been punished the investor yes but also the tenant if you kick one you hurt the other at the same time so that's kind of what we're seeing i, I think this means right and i think you touched on him what the implications are to yeah. property investors yeah. of all of this um do you have you noticed the strategies are changing mm-hmm. um i've noticed this um where people wish to buy buy to lets uh, i would argue most buy to lets in the uk now or especially in england are not profitable. Yes. Um, you know, I, I would really recommend people look at different parts of the country if you're going to go down the whole house to yeah, yeah. out a buy to let. Because when I've looked at this, where is where are you getting cash flow from, mm-hmm. right? Unless you go northwest, yeah. uh, Leeds will probably fall in some places, but Newcastle in England, around those areas, mm-hmm. you may get cash flow. Yeah. There is a risk of sleep, but you can get a cash flow. Scotland, Wales, yeah. are cash flowing, but everywhere else, it's very hard to buy a buy to let and actually have the rent oh, yeah. cover even just the mortgage and leave you some money out after. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't structure it, it compounds even worse. Yeah. Right. So I think a lot of people leave buy to lets, and that's where I think when you talk about service accommodation and things like this, people are having to do those strategies to get cash flow. Yeah, exactly. And if that becomes too uh, too much compliance and legislation, mm-hmm. you're going to ultimately have a dying property industry, which yes. for the UK is a big no-no. Yeah, yeah. We, are, we need it, because that is one way people build their pension, uh, whether it's directly or indirectly in a pension, depending on what strategy mm-hmm. you're doing. 
that's how they're going to live on. Otherwise, we're going to have more burden on the state in the future. Yes. I don't right. think the, the people making these rules have actually thought it through and looked at the 10, 20, 30 year impact yeah. of what is happening. We're feeling it now. Remember, mm -hmm. legislation changed quite happily in 2015, 16 for the tax on interest. We're feeling the impacts now even more because yeah. it fully came in by 2020. It was gradual, but the market, that's a huge shock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, And I think these things, if they keep on doing them, we're going to affect it. HMOs, licensing starting to get everywhere. Yeah. That's stopping people doing HMOs, so therefore, less capacity. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, quite a huge impact. I don't know what you're seeing in your property strategies up in uh, across the UK through Blue Bricks magazine and things. You're right. And I, I said to, to my business partner in that business, I said, look, this has got a time limit on it. Yeah. I think we've got three to five years, if we're being generous, before this is something will come in to make it hard or impossible. Um, I know there's a time limit on that. I've got my own strategy for avoiding that. What's happening at the moment is, yeah, a lot of people are going to surface accommodation because that's like the last thing we can do, right? HMO's article for that's come hard, but I tell it's that profitable. What can I do? I'll do surface accommodation. If legislation comes in for that, yeah. which it will, um, that's going to really tighten the industry to a point where a lot of these people are just going to say, well... I'll just get rid then. What what else is left unless a new strategy comes around? I think the, the finance and the support is so important. Yeah. I find that people don't think about how they use different financing mm -hmm. aspects, whether they're using personal business leverage or SaaS yes. pensions or investors in their uh, ecosystem to be able yeah. to do this. If you don't do this, you're going to struggle. So mm -hmm. financing and having the right property strategy, right structure and the advice you know, I'm finding a lot of people coming to us about that. that because they don't, most people don't understand property and they definitely don't understand the county tax, which is related, mm -hmm. how that industry works and how to move the money from a trading business into that and all the rest of the fund. Mm -hmm. I think that is the drive that people now have to be investing in knowledge yeah. with people specialising in that yeah, sector. Yeah, absolutely. And over leveraging, and a lot of people over leveraging <sighs> too much debt. You're right. I think... Like I say, property, I, I think there's a lot of people over the years like, I'll just buy this property and it was easy back then, didn't put too much thought on it, on it that are feeling the squeeze now. And I think getting the right advice from the right people is, is the only way to do it. And surrounding yourself with like-minded people, people going through the same journey, it can help you through, through what you're doing, which is why I'm so passionate about the community is I don't have all the answers, but I can... I know the people that do and I can bring them all together in a room to help you and that's yeah. what's so important to me. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. The last question, because you've added so much oh, value, right? I really appreciate it. Do you believe there's a recession or not? I'm gonna put you on the spot here. <laughs> do, do, do I believe or not? Um, I, I don't know. I've heard mixed things from so many different people. Uh, really good people that say different things. The general consensus that I've heard seems to be that we are in a recession. Um, and I've heard lots of people say that we're absolutely not and we're coming into a boom. So the truth is, <laughs> I I don't know. I, um, I, yeah. I, 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 I won't sit on the fence. I think they're in cuckoo land if they believe that we're coming to a boom because yeah. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not. And I think the, the next bit is you've seen some of the impacts because yeah. one of the recessions inflation is normally one of the outputs of uh, when we're in a recession because they're normally quite correlated is the rising costs mm -hmm. because that cuts the margin cuts the benefit of being an entrepreneur yeah have you you've noticed that in your business the costs are rising right yeah or, or with, with everything that the costs rise substantially um you know print magazines print postage that that goes up that's gone up wow. like two or three times since i've had the magazine wow. uh, when the print has gone right well we've got had an extra hundred couple hundred pounds on now it's hard because i never want to you know i i want blue bricks to be a valuable thing and although people pay a subscription i'm yeah. and we make money from that to me it's more about how many people can i impact and how many people can I help and how many members can we have wow. so i don't then want to go if i put the subscription price up every time my print costs went up it would be ever changing so yeah, yeah we, we we've definitely felt the, the, the pinch there and even in small things you know like petrol like ju just traveling no, down, small thing yeah yeah <laughs> you know you know traveling down here it ma makes that uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, but I do a lot of travel to a lot of places. That's probably more personal than business, but uh, no, I think you're right. There, I've yeah. noticed that cost of labor, yeah. Um, you mentioned some materials, but a yeah. lot of stuff where you're getting other 
bits they're going up yeah. um, the minimum wage is rapidly gone up people yes. don't realize these are all implications they're making uh, it harder to be an entrepreneur and one of the biggest ones which i have to finish on is if the, we're watching this post the winter statement in 2023 as we speak when we're recording this is uh, end of November 2023 and the reason why I mentioned that is um, you'll know what context I'm talking about tax has risen for entrepreneurs we're at the highest amount of tax for a long time and uh, yeah. not just for the everyone in the economy but the the risk of being an entrepreneur, and I think I did a um, mo uh, post about this, right. people just don't know what the numbers are. It is it is for it hasn't been for a long time, but actually being an entrepreneur it actually costs you more for every pound you earn than the employee that works for you. Yeah. That is not logical. That tells me the people running the economy don't understand what drives the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if they don't drive the economy correctly, this is why we ended up in this bit of mess. Yeah. Um, because they constantly are making the wrong decisions. They're incentivizing just for votes. They're not incentivizing for what's happening. I'm going to knock that one over. Yeah, like, it, I, I don't know if you've noticed that that the major cost structures are changing and you, how much money you're keeping is changing as well. I, I th We could do enough podcast on this, though, can't we? <laughs> I have a strong opinion that Britain, as a culture, we have a problem with people making money. Yeah, I don't understand. We, we have this huge issue with anyone making money. If someone makes money, then we don't like them. That's why property investors are hated. Yeah, and it's why, you know, yeah. I, I used to work in organisations, probably up on my own business, and the employees there, the same employees that are lazy, not working and taking two hour lunch breaks, going, well, I should get a cut of the director's wage. And, but basically what's happening is if you penalise business owners yeah. and entrepreneurs and you say, There's, we're going to increase the risk, but we're not going to increase the reward. In fact, the more money you earn, we're just going to tax you more. Everyone's just going to say, you know what, sod this. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to work nine to five. I'm going to have less risk. I'm going to have more time. And I'll probably have the same money at the end of it. Let's go for it. And then there's no employment, which affects the economy. And then it all goes down. I, I think people don't realise entrepreneurs contribute so much to mm -hmm. the, uh, the economy. And UK is historically yeah. based on that. Uh, or based on that. And uh, people look at it in the wrong way. We need those. We're drawing, and the whole economy is based and driven by that. Yeah. So it's a big thing. Listen, Sam, we've gone through so much value. Thank you okay. for your answers, giving us all insight. And I hope the audience have got huge value. Yeah, Please do like and comment below, uh, whichever social media platform you're seeing these podcasts on, uh, whether it's the clips or the full mount, because Sam is given so much value from an entrepreneur who's going places. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Thank you for so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really appreciate watching the Next Level Finance podcast. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, episode of the podcast. We're doing this to add value to your entrepreneur journey, which is have a quick catch up on this is that just to remind you we've got free business guides in the comments below they've got huge value in them for property investors property developers SaaS pensions and if you've got growing bit trading business as well if you after you consume those guides that have got exclusive sky tv episodes in them please do get in contact with us the contact details are there and we can help shape your entrepreneur journey and unlock financial freedom thank you so much